Well, Silligurke hier, mal wieder mit einem Werbevideo für den gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server Lasergurkenland mit der LP 149.202.1.7.134. Alternativ haben wir die Domain sillyhuhn.com. Ähm, ja, nicht verwirren lassen, dass es sillyhuhn.com ist. Der Server heißt Lasergurkenland. Äh, keine Ahnung, irgendwann äh, erwerbe ich vielleicht noch. Nein, ich werde wahrscheinlich nie die, eine Lasergurkenland-Domain erwerben, aber naja. Ich hatte mal vor Ewigkeiten eine, vor, keine Ahnung, vielleicht 5, 6 Jahren oder so, aber ja, genau. Ähm, ja, wir laufen hier in die richtige Richtung und dieses Mal haben wir einen spannenden Defcon Talk hier vorbereitet über Shellcode ähm, und zwar von Hadrian Barrel über... Ähm, mit dem Titel The ABC of Next Gen Shell Coding von der DEFCON Conference. Oh mein Goodness! DEFCON Conference 27. Ähm, genau, aus 2019 ist es. Und let's get started. Hadrian <coughs> Barrel, The ABC of Next Gen Shell Coding. Hello, Defcon. How are you today? Brilliant. Very glad to be here today. We're going to talk about the ABC of next generation shell coding. A lot of interesting things. So let me just say a few words of disclaimer before I begin. Don't look at what's written there. We are going to have a deep dive into the dark arts of shell coding. We use brute force mathematics, wizardry, bit of dancing will make your head spin at some point and the idea will be to build up obscure incantations to make computers do things to each other we'll conjure monsters give you nightmares and hopefully we'll stay until the end so that you know why we do all these things hmm. so just a few words about who we are uh, the three of us you've got Adrien Jean-Rathen and myself Uh, we, we work at the university, we work as researchers in security and the point of the talk today, more mm. precisely, is creative methods, and I insist on creative, to write shell code, mm. or exploitation code, under constraints, on new architectures, oh, and we will illustrate that on an architecture that is not even easy to find actually right now, because it's uh, not yet deployed though. So just a reminder, who, who amongst you has ever written a shell code? Just raise your hand for me. Well, that's the flex. Ah, okay, so you know how it works, so you think at least. Um, <laughs> for the other half, this is what shell code is. It is essentially code that you wrote or found in a target's memory and that you want to jump to. And no, falsche Richtung, echt jetzt? The shell, so that's why you call it the shell code. But it doesn't have, have to have a shell, shell. whatever you like. To, to actually jump to the shell code, uh, you have to trigger the neurotility, uh, a buffer overflow, a use after free, high confusion, whatever. Um, but the typical scenario is that your target uh, runs a program, the program accepts user input. And so you Boah, write ich bin echt so oft im Kreis gelaufen in diesem Turm und dann bin so ich falsch und hast du hin. your code in memory Spassen. and jump to it. So you have a nice picture on the screen there, the target's memory. Uh, gets the shellcode inserted and you need to jump to it using the vulnerability. So that's very nice. The issue with that is that it's not that easy. For those of you who actually wrote shellcodes, you know it's not trivial. Um, there are constraints because it has to pass as user input, so you can't have uh, terminating zeros in, in your strings. There might be stack protections. You may have limited memory. You may not know where the shellcode is in memory. That's, that's annoying, really. It turns out you can work around these constraints. You, you, ca you can always succeed, nevertheless, uh, using clever techniques. We are not going to talk about the techniques to bypass existing mit mitigations because, well, they're well known. And that's not the point of the talk today. What I'm going to talk about is the fact that the shell code, such as this thing, does not look like user input. I mean, perhaps you guys input such things, 
but the normal human beings, which are not here today, would not. And there are several things that give it away. Uh, things such as um, the non presence of not characters. characters, not instructions in the code, the non-printable characters in it, the presence of suspicious substrings such as BNSH, <laughs> and the fact that you have bits that I mean look like. Aber well, passt es irgendwer places. irgendwo? Like, also like solche Sachen? Suspicious, and this is detectable. Aber which means antivirus or blue teams or I mean your annoying neighbors will find out that what you're writing is actually a shellcode and perhaps make it uh, a problem for you. So we try to stay under the radar. And one idea to that, one illustration of that, to pass as human inputs, especially for strings, is that you want your shellcode to be written using, for instance, just ASCII characters, ASCII printable characters, or perhaps okay. just alphanumeric characters, or username, for instance, perhaps English words, just want to write poetry, you can inspire it, Jesus. it turns out to be a shell code. Tess, yeah. And why not even Shakespeare's poets? So, why would you do that? What, what, for How one, would you do that, is the question. It really looks like it's just English texts. It does not trigger alarm that much. And you have plausible deniability. You could just say, this is poetry. This is the lyrics of my next song. <laughs> right? It's, it is it is not an NSA implant. Well, of course it is. But, okay. uh, it is also less likely to be escaped or broken because it is already text. It doesn't have any special character, so your exploit might work better. Mm. And if everything else fails, you can always try the pickup line at the bar. Okay? So do try that. The only question remaining is: Is that feasible? Can I write my code, my programs, my eternal blue? using only English words. Yes. Take the x86 instruction set, for instance, and just look at what the letters look like when you disassemble. You've got, for capital letters, A to O, you've got uh, in increment and decrement operations. Oh. For the others, you've got push and pop, so stack operations. You've got jumps, you've got XOR, so you can actually do a lot of things. Hey, wieso sieht man dann so selten out, Buchstaben? Uh, naja. Ich frage mich, ob es da schon einen Transpiler gibt so oder einen Compiler, wie auch immer das man nennt, der Shellcode in uh, ASCII wieder schreibt. Ja, was für Christopher Domus neben dem Morpheus Kater. English Subset. Oh well, my God. Ich kann noch weiter gehen. Und zum Beispiel hier werden wir sehen, wie wir für einige englische Checkcoding machen. Es wurde fast exakt 10 Jahre alt von Masson und anderen. Die Idee ist, es exakt das gleiche zu machen wie vorher, aber jetzt werden wir einen englischen English kompatiblen Subset von X86 generieren. This is exactly alphanumeric as before, but you have even more than alphanumeric characters. So you can have spaces, you can have punctuation, uh, you can have uh, colons, semicolons, you can have dashes, uh, you can have some special characters. Uh, and for example, it gives you even more instructions uh, uh, than that. For example, if you look at point, you can have more uh, operands available as before. And if you look, for example, at space, you have one more opcode, uh, which gives you the end instruction. So we have more than that. So the fundamental idea behind that is that you do a normal shellcode, so you write a small decoder with those instructions, then you cut it into sm small snippets of code that would fit into English words, then you have some gaps, you, uh, and those gaps you can jump from each snippet uh, to another using ju the jump instruction you can see there, and just the idea is to fill those gaps with something that makes your shellcode look like English uh, English text. Of course, this is done using Markov chains. Uh, so Markov chains fundamentally are just uh, the auto-completion uh, feature on your iPhones. So you write a word and then it gives you some other words. So it can give you some pretty nice text uh, if you write uh, some, uh, uh, some, uh, some SMSs with uh, that. And uh, 
Ja, es ist kein WhatsApp-Feature, ne? das macht gar keinen Sinn. Das ist in der Tastatur drin, das habe ich in einem letzten Video gesagt, da habe ich mir da schon gedacht, Quatsch. Ja. Peinlich. So, this is what I did on my computer. So, here we will go for a standard uh, set user ID exploitation. So the ID is you have, uh, the ID behind it is that you have a program that would be executed as a root program, but it can be executed by the standard user. For example, if you want to change your password. Ja, aber das ist ja lokal. Das geht ja nicht mal. By, uh, user. So you have a program executing Als ob irgendwer... In einem lokalen Programm so eine Protection dagegen hat. Die kannst du ja genauso gut überschreiben. Das macht ja nur bei Server-Applications Sinn, oder? Uh, shell that pops out, so we can check that indeed we are root here. <laughs> Geil. Ist schon, ist schon nice. Kann man nichts sagen. Kann man nichts sagen. More generally, uh, when we speak about x86, uh, it's almost fully solved. So the idea is that you have, uh, for example, MSFP norm. So you just say, I want uh, some shell code on x86. With these restrictions on the instruction set, so I want only alphanumeric, I want alpha plus uh, some characters, I want something that looks like a new URL, I want something that looks like a, a path, and this kind of thing. And it automatically generates you uh, whatever is required so that uh, it, everything goes well. In principle, we could even write uh, some fully functional shellcodes from only Shakespeare's work, uh, but uh, what we'll be uh, speaking about uh, in the next... <gasps> Mending? Oh mein Gott! Oh mein Gott! Oh mein Gott! Now we're going to take this. And as was just mentioned, what powers most devices today is slowly drifting away from x86, including phones, including voting machines, including several interesting things that we'd like to run shell codes on. Um, and to do that, we need to look at the way, for instance, risk instructions such as ARM um, work. It turns out that you don't use the techniques which are described on ARM. The reasons are you do not have any more single character instructions, We do not have as many addressing modes, in particular we lack, we lack the memory to memory addressing modes, and we have constraints on operands that make it very tricky and actually, so far, impossible to write shellcodes for risk file. Uh, does not work uh, on, on, on ARM actually as, as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about three approaches, very quickly about the two, first, the two, two uh, compilation and emulation techniques, and a bit more about unpacking techniques. So three ways around these limitations that allow us to work nevertheless. The compilation approach, the first approach, consists in combining Ach, keine Ahnung, ja, wahrscheinlich schon. directly to the constraint instruction set, so directly to our numeric, for instance, uh, operations. The, the Good things about it is that it may be possible to Mending write one is richtig set stark. easily. That's the mock cascader, for instance, written by Christopher Thomas. Yeah. Uh, that's that. The, the, the main the advantage of such an approach is that uh, it does not work when the constraints are on the operands and not on the opcodes. And also, who wants to write a compiler? <laughs> I mean, Christopher Thomas. If is in the, in the room, do it, please. <laughs> means that we won't. That's just the lifetime's work. Second approach, the emulation way. To do that, you write an interpreter for some language, you write your payload in that interpreted language, and uh, you just run that. The thing is, you have to write the in interpreter um, once, and once that's done, well, you can reuse it for different payloads. Also, well, that was absolutely worth it for Runter to go. And Philippers uh, for ARM7. They did a brainfuck interpreter, mm. and One that works. The issue with that is what? Well, it's interpreted. 
which means it's toothless, you cannot really call syscalls, you cannot really do fancy stuff that you'd like to do with the shell group, right? So this leaves us with the third approach, which we introduced some years ago, and the idea is a several step process. So let me just take some time to explain that one. The first step is that your payload will be encoded in a constraint compliant way. So for instance, if you want uh, an alphanumeric shellcode, you would first encode it in some uh, alphanumeric way. You hide it, as you can see on the top right picture. Then you look at the ISA targeting and you identify high level constraint compliant constructs. Boah, das Mending klatsche ich so, so hart auf eine der Pickaxe. Ah, that fuck, that das geht ja nicht mehr drauf, oder? Oh, muss ich echt mal schauen. Das habe ich jetzt nicht gecheckt mit dem Packer. Ah, habe ich nicht gut genug zugehört. Irgendwas in memory. Aber in, in Memory übersetzen, wo ist, wie ist das einfacher als einfach einen simplen Compiler oder so zu schreiben? I don't know. Okay, so now that you saw how you can oder limitiert, ja, vielleicht, ja, keine Ahnung. Limitations of usual ARM processes. Uh, as we are, everyone is turning around from AX86, we do not turn our attention to risk 5 for various reasons. So, this file, maybe we've never heard about it. It is a new architecture. Uh, basically, it is, a, a, once again, a RISC architecture, very much like MIPS, if you heard about it. It ends up being open source and also open hardware, and it is still very work in progress. Mm. By this, I mean that the specification is not completely done yet. There is very few silicon available, but hopefully, uh, in a few, few years, we'll see CRISPR everywhere. There are many companies interested in it, so it remains to be seen, but hopefully it is the future of the future. We do have one issue with S5 when it comes to a family shell coding. It is that it makes our job much, much harder. So, let's look at what is available for us in alphanumeric S5. So first, we can load a few constants with typically the load, load immediate and load after immediate. Then we have small increments. If you combine both of them, it means you can load quite a lot of values in the registers. Then we have some branches, both conditional and unconditional, but only forward branches. We do not have any backward branches, so that's an issue. Then we have a single uh, arithmetic instruction, which is a right shift. Why not? And then we have a system register fight. Uh, the issue with this, this instruction is that it is only available at higher privilege levels. Typically, it would work if you uh, are attacking uh, Linux, or your, oper your operating system, but not just a simple program. So we no. use for that reason since we want something quite generic. And finally, we do have Mesalino's floating point operation. As you've seen, we have no loops, because no backward jump, no store. Wow, no that's not really nicht gebracht. Yeah, we are with that. And I can even tell you, it is not even Turing complete. So, Warte mal, steckt der da let's drin? look at what a typical this file instruction is. And it should look at the first loop of the instruction. By the way, presentation of the instruction, you have the opcode, and so then this is exactly what the ASCII character is. 
So, we will just allow ourselves uh, one more single printable character. As a spoiler, Ist ja der eingestiegen. Ich habe gesagt, dass es drei neue printable Charakter gibt, die man machen kann, um aus dem No-Look, No-Store und No-Store-Issue zu machen. Wir haben Hash, Slash und typisch Hash wird uns einen uh, regular Store geben. Mit regular Stores können wir unseren Unpacker schreiben. So, let's look at how it works, uh, for, uh, writing, also, wir schauen, wie es funktioniert, um Writing Alphanumeric plus Hash Uh, shell code on respect. So, here is the architecture. We have three stages. Uh, on the left is the stage one. First, we wow, have the initialization. Then we do use a forward jump, which is a jump and link. Uh, with a jump and link, it means that you can actually get the PC of a shell code, which is quite useful if you do not know exactly where your shell code is in memory. Since we have a forward jump, we have some wasted space. So we use the wasted space to uh, first uh, encode payload, then we write our unpacker, this is the hard thing to do, but we won't unpack directly the payload, we will first unpack the stage 2. The reason we do this is because uh, it is difficult to write a generic unpacker, but writing an unpacker for a specific code is much easier, so we have our stage 2, our stage 2 is much more straightforward, it is just a simple decoded loop, with because Now we have loads, and we just impact something. So uh, stage two will impact the final encoded payload, and then we won. We have something which works. So uh, let me just show you a little demo on the only silicon available right now, which is the high five and list four. Okay. So this is basically what the shell code looks like. Uh, You can see that basically all the hashes that correspond to our store instructions. This time uh, we assume we have ja, gut, a das ist nicht wirklich Englisch, uh, aber alles printable. We will just send it, uh, send our shellcode on the socket. As you can see, we've sent it. We now have a root shell. We can check that we are indeed root. And if we check the CPU type, it is indeed a RISC-V CPU in the middle. RISC 5 äh, Shellcode habe ich auch noch nicht gesehen, aber deswegen ja Next Gen. Ne? Well, let's go a little bit dirtier. Uh, so we have seen what uh, hash can do. So it gives you uh, standard stores. Uh, so now we will switch to the other character, which is to another character, which is slash. Uh, which can be really useful when you are writing, for example, URLs or facts uh, in, a, in a Linux uh, operating system. Uh, of course. Switching to hash uh, to slash instead of slash of hash uh, does not give us standard stores anymore. So we have to find a new ri a memory writing primitive uh, to compensate for that. Of course, slash is not taken uh, out of nowhere uh, because this uh, character gives us atomic operations. Uh, so we have two uh, mainly useful atomic operations. So the first one, for example, a 23 slash gives us atomic or, and the other is atomic and. Fundamentally, an atomic OR operation reads 64 bits from the memory, stores it in a register, and then stores back to the memory the same uh, value or with another register. So the end is exactly the same with the on end operation. No, I'm not Oh, of course. Gosh. Uh, so given that I can read and write 64 bits into the memory, so this is a memory writing primitive. So the idea is just to uh, to write my stage 2 with those instructions. However, in RISC-V, uh, there is a little constraint for uh, atomic operations, which was not there for stores. Uh, and it says that the address held in uh, the register must be naturally aligned to the size of the operand. And if the address is not naturally aligned, a misaligned extra exception will be generated. So that's fine. It's six, it's eight bytes. I have to align it on eight bytes. So the idea is I have a pointer to which I write to. I write my eight bytes. Then I increase this, this pointer by eight, and I continue writing. Like so we have to use some add immediate instruction that will allow us to increase the pointer. So we look at the available instructions. We look for the add immediate. Then we take the shortest one, and of course the shortest add is of sixteen. So. We are fucked now, so we have to find a way to go out of it. 
the solution is to use uh, 16 byte chunks because we are obliged to move our pointer over 16 bytes out of which only the 8 are controllable so the idea is we will use 6 only out of them so it's even better uh, and we will put an instruction at the beginning uh, that would be our real construction of the stage 2 then an up-like operation and then we will put a jump instruction that will jump to the next block uh, here we decided to put 2 bytes and 2 bytes instead of 4 bytes of instruction because it was easier to build uh, the shell code and just because we are lazy so. So using some black magic, uh, so I will explain all of this, all of it uh, step by step. So here is uh, the example of uh, some code that allows you to to write exactly one block, to load into the memory one block, and uh, we will use uh, some GDB uh, over uh, dimmer uh, to look how what it does exactly. So other black magic here, uh, we load uh, in the initialization section a uh, magic value in uh, the CP uh, register, which is 8031004, and let's go. Lloyd, uh, what so the first fuck? We zero at four. Then we would do the atomic end to the uh, chunk, which in practice would zero all the, ch uh, the first eight bytes of the chunk, which is exactly what we want. Then we would do the OR with the register that has the magic value. So it loads 8031 into the memory, which is exactly what we want because this is a jump 12, which will jump to the next block. Then you load a magic value into A0. You shift it by 12. You subtract 10 out of it. And then you do again an atomic OR uh, to the memory, which would lo load into the, the chunk 97A0 and 0005. 97A0 is exactly at A4, A4, SP, which is one of the instructions of the stage 2. And 0005 is the knock operation, which is exactly what we want. So, the idea behind it is just you do exactly the same for every instruction of your stage 2. So, you had a load upper immediate instruction, you shift it by an amount, and then you put some add uh, immediate instructions, so small or bigger, uh, on 32 bits. Uh, and uh, you just brute force on all those instruction sequences so at the end it will allow you to load one value into the, the, the chunk so if you have several instru instruction sequences that do the same thing you keep the shortest one and if your stage 2 does not fit into the instruction sequences you found so you just modify it, you tweak it a little bit and this will give you so here is exactly the stage 2, so sorry I had no place uh, for putting it uh, vertically, so just please turn your head 90 degrees. Uh, so <laughs> here, if we look at it, you have exactly uh, the she put her bed, huh? uh, Okay, so let me put it back uh, in the right order. So you have the, the body of the loop, so everybody knows what's in the body of the das loop. Das kann so ich jetzt nicht lesen, während ich hier spiele, Alter. Here, it becomes normal, I think. Okay, so let's get back, so you have the jump instructions. You have your knock instructions, so you have a uh, left shift at the end, which is which shifts uh, a register that we do not care about, so it's a knock like instruction. And you have the real stuff here, which is exactly the stage two. And we had some, you have the two byte instructions, and there is one instruction that is four bytes long, which is the fence instruction, which allows you to clear the cache. Uh, if you have a self modifying code, this is absolutely essential. Uh, and for this, we just hand wrote the, the instruction sequence. And it's only one instruction though, so that's fine. So, let's get back to the demo. So, here. So, we still have our shellcode here, so you can see the slash uh, characters that tell you that it's an atomic operation. And we will send it to the same application that has another filter now, so instead of filtering out all uh, the hash characters, so it will only keep the slash characters. So, we send it. We got our shell, so we do ID, this is root, and if we check again the CPU, so it's again respite. Okay, so let us look at this nice quote from XKCD. Eva, you're handing out whole floating point variables, sorry. Or you've built a database to track individual atoms. In either case, please stop. Well, I'm very pleased to tell you that we are not going to build a database to track individual atoms, which means we are going to have fun with floating points. The last character, tech, gives us, gives us floating point stores, and that's pretty difficult to work with. So, 
as a women, as a women do, we only want to change the input rail to other parts of our architecture without change. But instead of using regular stores or atomic store, we need to write our first impacker with floating point store. So, uh, floating point 0.1 for people who need it. Uh, floating point representation in memory uh, has three fields, Mantisa, exponent, and the sign, and the mathematical representation of this uh, binary representation is very roughly Mantisa times 2 to the power of the exponent plus the sign. Is the roof, but it's much enough for this presentation. So, our idea to write the impacker is to first load some floating point value from the memo memory. Since it is from the memory, it means that it must be alphanumeric. Then do some computation, and hopefully at the end we have a chunk of our, of our stage two in uh, our register. Storage memory. Schlecht. We repeat this for each chunk and we have our impacker. Obviously, the issue here is which value do I pick and which computation do I do? Well, uh, let's look at what is available on Athenoway Quiz 5 on the term of floating point operations. So first we have loads and stores. Well, that's a good thing. And then we, have, we need to find our operation to work on those loaded values. So first we have quad to double conversions, but since we do not have double to quad, it's like not super useful. Then we have sign manipulation, such as, for example, taking the absolute value of a floating point register, but it will only change a single bit in the register, so it's not super useful. And finally, we do, ha we do have choose multiply add instruction, which has multiple variants. So, uh, Choose multiply add is an operation which has three inputs and one output. And basically, it combines uh, multiply and uh, add in a single instruction. Oh my god, ich hab so, schon uh, boot, das hätte ich mal. And the variants have some minus sign in the middle. So, for example, if we have the instruction fm sub uh, ft6, fs2, ft4, fa0, it means that the floating point register t6 will be set to the result of h2 times t4 minus a0. So, uh, here's how we want to store a chunk our stage 2. Let's say we want to store the 16-bit value ABCD in hexadecimal. On the right, you can see our uh, field multiply instruction, and we need to set A, B, and C, which must all be alphanumeric, such that A uh, does contain ABCD in the end. So, first, we'll just take a random thing for A. Okay, why not? Then, same thing, we will take a random thing for B. And at this time, at this point, we only have a single input left, so we can mathematically solve for it. And in this time, if we want R to have ABCD in the low bits, it means that C is something quite difficult, BZ and non alphabetic character, so it doesn't work. So what we do is that we try again, we take another B, Again, solve mathematically on it. This time we are lucky. C is alphanumeric, as you can see, it is BBOQ CCZ6, and this time we have a good result in R. So you, you might want to ask, oh, how long do I have to try to find good Bs? Well, not that much, only 10,000 times. And since we're doing it on the computer, 10,000 tries is like nothing. So it's like really efficient. And I don't have a proof of, of it for you here, but I can tell you, just trust me, that it works if I change ABCD to anything. It works for all 16 big values. And even better than that, when we wrote our thing, we saw that we could actually control much more than 16 bits. As you can see uh, on the right, uh, on the left, uh, the just before ABCD, we have lots of zeros, which, which means we can actually control all these bits. Otherwise, there would be random. So we can actually have all 48 bits, which means that with three, three, uh, three 64 bits value, we get 48 bits of output. So well, we have quite a good impactor here. So we do it for every part of our stage two, and then again, we have an impactor, and all the rest works fine. So again, a little demo. So 
you have already said it, but this time it is with tech. So uh, on top, you can see the encoded payload. On the bottom, you can see the unpacker with all text corresponding to a 14 point star. Once again, we are sending it to our vulnerable application, which this time accepts Alphanoid plus tech. We get our roadshow. As you can see, we are out. And once again, you can guess it, this is the same CPU, it is still a REST type CPU. Okay, I hope you did not expect that. Um, so we, we went through different new techniques to write code. We focused on alphanumerics, but as you can probably imagine, these are tricks that some of them weren't known before. We tried to bring you to navigate the yoga of writing constraint char code, to avoid filters, to fool ideas and humans as well, to target specific applications. Um, as we mentioned, the x86 environment is already quite mature, so this is a sort of problem there, almost. But new architectures, and in particular Lyrix 5, is something that's, that's gaining momentum, and we need to keep up. It would be unacceptable that it goes public before we have attacks for it, right? So we show that it is possible to write alphanumeric shell codes uh, even on very constrained instruction sets. And what we described to you, the impacker, was the hard part, really. And the decoder was the hard part. And now what remains is just to put your payload, any payload, arbitrary payload, this is a world first, by the way. So, more than tricks and techniques, uh, we have introduced new approaches that can be transported to other architectures. And for those of you who are really curious how to use that, uh, for once, do come to uh, our talk next week. Uh, the, do read the paper that, we've been, yeah, that has been published uh, yesterday. All the code is open source. You can actually find everything there if you're curious. And you have no excuse whatsoever, so no get hashing and slashing and clicking for fun and for profit. Uh, read the code, send us a friendly email. Thank hmm. you very much, your friendly neighborhood hackers. Das war doch mal ein sehr interessanter Talk. Okay, ihr wisst Bescheid, der Talk ist zu Ende. Das war ein Vortrag von der DEFCON. Oh mein Gott, ich sollte dabei nicht hier runterfallen. Von der DEFCON, was war es, 27 aus dem Jahre 2019, ähm, vorgetragen von Hadrian Barrel. Es haben mehrere Leute, wieso steht da nur ein Name? Oh mein Gott, wirf mich nicht vom Berg runter. Hadrian Barrel, the <coughs> ABC of Next Gen Shell Coding. Ähm, genau. Oh mein Gott. Oh, whoopsie. <coughs> genau, und. Ja, der Server hier ist Laser Gurkenland, ein gratis erreichbarer Minecraft-Server ohne Regeln. Hier ist die Bildenergie los mit der IP-Adresse 1902.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1